Okay. Hi, Don. How are you? Fine. Yourself? Doing well. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I Welcome. appreciate I'm it. Welcome. I'm glad you wanted to have me here. So you're an author. You're in Canada. Yeah? That's right. Where in Canada are you? Uh, Southern Ontario in the city of London, Ontario. Oh, I know where that is. Okay. You're not that yeah. far from Toronto. Nope, just between Toronto and Windsor. Yeah. I Almost halfway. I spent uh, a good deal of 2003 in Toronto and absolutely loved the city. It was a great place. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, I've, I've visited Toronto and it's a lovely city and I don't know what it's like now, but when I was there in 2000, 2007, 2010, and in the previous decade, it was really a wonderful city. Yeah. Yeah. So you're here to promote a book. Uh, your book is called, why don't you pronounce the title? Because I <laughs> Ithia, okay, here it goes. Ithia. Ithiana, Last Daughter of Atlantis, Book One, How the World Ended Millennia Ago. Uh, Ithiana, okay. What, what is that name derivative from? Well, I based it on, uh, first of all, Douglas, I based my, my character's name on a character from the short film on which this book is loosely based. And Ithiana is a is a derivative of the Greek word ictus for fish. Oh, okay. And because she's because she even though she's human, she's an amphibious human. Is she a mermaid? A mermaid by technicality, and would and I guess she's the kind of mermaid who would always assert that real mermaids have legs and feet. <laughs> <laughs> so she does not have legs and feet. Well, she does have legs and feet because she is because she's just as human as you or I, but she was amphibianized oh. at age five. Oh, I see. Well, that's that's interesting. I'm having trouble picturing what she looks like, but OK, I'll leave it to oh, my imagination. OK, so this book is at all based on the story of Atlantis. Yes. It, in, in my my version of it, that is, I took a totally different a near totally different take on Atlantis and set it during the days of Noah's flood. It's in large part about the world of Noah, what it was like, and because it factors in it, I factored in Atlantis, I could not for the life I could not for the life of me decide. Well, I could decide, I did decide, sorry, but I decided I just couldn't in all conscience decide that the world of Noah in my book was going to be rustic, primitive, still evil, but just rustic and primitive like it's often been depicted. So I had to make Atlantis on par with our technology or more advanced. Like in the book, I mentioned calm crystals. They're, they use them like we use the smartphones. And even uh, the main character's love interest along with the main character herself, they use the calm crystal in a way that nauseates, not infuriates, sorry, the main character's aunt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, people can be very ir irritating with their cell phone usage. Oh, sure, yeah. And I based my Atlantis in terms of the social, sociology in term, I base it on the world we know today. This is a book series. Yep, the first of the first in the series. Yes, first of the series. OK, how many books do you expect to do in this series? Well, well, Douglas, I have no fixed idea in mind, but. I would say as long as as many as it turns out to be, and I've been thinking about because this is sort of the prologue book, because this is where the story starts. And it has this, um, I'd have this main character go through time and space to learn what she needs to learn and unlearn what she needs to unlearn. All at the behest of God personified as the Lion of Judah. Let me ask you something uh, on your bio right at the top. It says that you are a Canadian who identifies with classic American ideals. Yes. What is or what are classic American ideals to a Canadian? Well, a lot of first of all, Canadians tend to be so envious of Americans that they that I hate to say this, I hate to break this to 
my American audience, but Canadians can be very nasty when they talk about Americans. Like, and and they can have their own take on who won the War of 1812. Like, it's commonly assumed that in the United States that America won that war. But Canadians have this mistaken thought, and I don't see the basis for it, that, can that Canada won, or sometimes they correct themselves the British won, when in fact the Treaty of Ghent actually declared the War of 1812 to be a stalemate, a draw. And I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but Canadians really feel a bit antsy. Well, lately it's been that's been changing because of the trucker convoys and how they're standing up for freedom because we're kind of discovering that freedom's important and life and the pursuit of happiness. They're important, but for a long time, Canadians were a little skittish of Americans proclaiming life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as if America invented it. So before, before the trucking convoy, uh, Canadians did not agree with the concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, many of us did, but we just tended to think more in terms of stability and in our constitution we have we talk about peace order and good government but if you have bad government the order will break down somehow and guess what happens when order breaks down peace goes with it you have chaos and you have anarchy you know. yes and we just and Canadians tend to have this idea that Americans always want to shoot people up and and sometimes it's borne out in the nightly news and we and Canadians tend to be backstabbing of Americans. Now, ironically, Ellen DeGeneres said that Can we Canadians are not as nice as we seem. Now, whether you love Ellen DeGeneres or whether you don't, that's your prerogative. Well, Ellen DeGeneres is not as nice as she seems, according to a yes, lot of other she, people. Yeah, maybe it takes one to know one. <laughs> yeah, she had many complaints filed against her for being vicious. Yes, to, I've heard about her abusive behaviors. Yeah. And how, but still, <laughs> can, Canadians can be pretty nasty, too. We may put on an, you know how someone can pretend to be a nice, personable person, they can be nice and friendly, so sweet, so polite. Yeah. But underneath the surface, they can be very nasty, kind of underhanded. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, I like things up front. What I find interesting about that idea of stability versus life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is that stability comes at a price to your freedom. Okay, and I think that may be one of the inspirations and the motivations for the truckers, the convoy, because yeah. in order to, I think the theory was that they're going to mandate vaccines and quarantine for everyone in order to create stability with regards to COVID. But the problem is it encroached on people's rights not to be vaccinated. And yeah. the vaccine has not been proven to stop transmission of the virus. You can, yeah. you can be triple vaxxed and still get the virus and still spread the virus. It's, or worse. Or worse. It remains to be seen if you are completely vaccinated and you get the virus, what is the potency of the virus that you can transmit? Is it diluted or is it full speed? Is it full potential? We don't really know the answer to that yet. And, and for all we... Oh, and a lot of people would believe that you might as well take a Smith & Wesson Colt 45 to your head with all chambers loaded and put it to pull the trigger. Because that's what, that's essentially, the vaccines have proven lethal. And I asked myself when I thought, what do I want to do that or are there other ways? And I have decided to go for natural immunity by boosting it with vitamins A through E and K and zinc and kelp. Well, I think that you're right. I think that you're right as a human yes. being on this planet to do that. You put yes. in your body what you feel is best for you. 
and and you know what? Always when it comes to added vitamins A, D, E, and K, always take them in capsule form, like as in gel caps or veggie caps, not solid pills. Let me hit on one of your talking points, and then we got to kind of wrap this up. Sure, sure. You mentioned Noah's Ark, and we briefly covered your book. On your talking points, it says, "What a Noah's Ark of today, a spacecraft would look like." When I read that, I immediately thought of that movie, 2012. Did you uh -huh. see that movie? Yes, I've seen that movie, and it's it was quite a good one. Yeah. Or if you wanted to build a space-based version, one you could build, say, what's called a Dyson sphere with some sort of propulsion method. You would have to have enough technology to sustain life and in space. Resources. And resources. And resources, right. Resources. Because how long do the astronauts stay at the space station, typically? A few months? Oh, a few months, and they have to re literally readjust to living and breathing back on Earth all over again. Yeah. So you'd have to be able to sustain life indefinitely in space. And and I and you're right. Good uh, it's good that you point out the movie 2012 and that arc. Well, that was a, a real sense. arc. Yeah, that was a that was a giant ship, but it was that still was the same ship. story basically. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, with my main kit in my book in Ithiana Last Out of Lands book 1, the space arc I had was a a star yacht that was refurbished, but this is less about plans of saving humanity and more about the politics behind each of the two plans. Ithiana's space art plan and Noah's simpler plan. Uh, why did you write this? What inspired you to write this? At first, like I said, it was based on my short film, The Last Atlantic, loosely. And I let that idea sit and I said, oh, I humored Dad saying, I'll make it when I feel I want to. And for a long time, I couldn't find work. So I just in, the, in my chosen field that is filmmaking. So I decided to, go, to turn to creative writing. The first book I wrote was The Invader Candidate, which was Invasion of the Body Snatchers meets the Manchurian Candidate. It didn't sell well, but I learned from many of the mistakes I made in that. And so I decided to go for what dad wanted me to write and make into something bigger, which which turned out to be Ithiana, Last Start of Atlantis. And so I was also motivated, Douglas, by the conditions of the world today. And so like, a, like I've kind of hinted at, I've taken the world of today and simply Atlantinized it and made the technology on par with ours or slightly ahead of ours and make us so much like the way we are today and that even at the end of the book tail end of the book the verse from matthew indicates the world of noah is like a lot what the world of the end times would be like so that's why i wrote the book and and because I always had a thing about atlantis and noah's flood and thinking atlantis must fit into the story of Noah's flood like a hand into a glove. Well, that's very interesting. And on that note, I think we're going to have to wrap up the interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Sure. Uh, it's my website is Donnyverse.com. That's D-O-N-N-Y-V-E-R-S-E dot com. OK, great. And there's links to your books and information about you. And yep. And you can get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Super. Well, Don, thanks again for coming on. Nice meeting you. Best of luck.